Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Next Economy Conversations. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this event, uh, this is actually our, our first edition of Next Economy Conversations, and this event uh, series is co-hosted by the Center for Social Innovation and the Social Innovation Institute, where you'll have an opportunity to hear from incredible leaders who are helping to make the recovery from the from the COVID-19 pandemic, one that creates positive change and that builds the next economy, one that is sustainable, equitable, and prosperous for all. We'll invite a new guest each month and um, we'll hear uh, from each guest about their personal journeys, successes, and, uh, and their visions for the future. And without further ado, I am delighted to introduce our host this morning for Next Economy Conversations, our fierce and fearless CEO of the Center for Social Innovation, Tanya Sermon. Tanya is fueled by her belief in the power of collaboration and belonging. She knows that building relationships between people is the foundation for a better world. And she also has a heck of a lot of fun doing it. Tanya, thank you so much for hosting our conversation this morning. Um, we'll, we'll hand it over to you to share a bit about what we mean by the next economy and to introduce our guest, Bill Young. Great. Thank you, Zoya. That was so lovely. I think that's the nicest intro I've ever had. Bill, don't expect that from me. That's all I'm saying. Just, <laughs> it's, uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to be here with you all this morning. It's um, so exciting to be finally uh, bringing together so much of our thinking around the next economy and starting this series of conversations. So, um, you know, we're in interesting times right now. Very, very interesting times. Nothing that I ever imagined is, uh, is happening. And what's fascinating is that COVID-19 seems to have, as, I, as I've said in many different groups, that you know, Mother Nature sent us to our room to think about what we'd done to her. And as we sit in week 10, for me, of, uh, of isolation or quasi-isolation, there's been a lot of time to reflect. And one of the things that we're seeing is that we're no longer the only ones. I think that we've been very privileged at CSI to be in a bubble of people who share our beliefs around market transformation, around systems change. But one of the things that's been really transformational about this experience is how many others are now starting to see the need to be able to bring about the systems change that we, um, that we need in our economic systems to ensure that we really are putting people and planet first. CSI and SII have been working on exploring the next economy world for a number of well, years, but uh, more intentionally in the last few months. You might recall, I have, to, I have to do it, this was our last issue of the Collider. And what's so interesting is on the front of the Collider, we're saying the next economy. Well, what is the next economy? Is it about wellness? Is it people-centered? Is it participatory, regenerative, reciprocal, green? circular. There are so many different ways people are using terms like conscious capitalism, social finance, all of these different kind of sub-movements. But ultimately what there is is a zeitgeist moment and I feel it more and more. And I feel like we're moving, absolutely moving to the next economy. And the question is, what's it going to look like? So I'm going to jump in and hopefully Tanya comes back in. <laughs> you can tell us just a little bit about your uh, what I know is to be a very impressive career that started in the private sector and then moved over into social impact. So we'd love to hear about that journey. Yeah, so, um, I mean, the short story of it is, uh, and, and thank you, uh, welcome to everybody, particularly to those in Victoria at 5.30 in the morning. That's a pain builds character moment if there ever has been one. Um, uh, so I always sort of say I'm, I'm one of these lucky people who happen to be in the right place at the right time in the private sector and um, uh, realized the Wheel of Fortune spun awfully well for me, sure doesn't spin well for everybody. And how could I take my business experience and leverage it in, in a different way rather than learn a whole new field of philanthropy, say, given that I was ready to make a career change? Um, what might that career change look like and how could I use my business experience uh, uh, in a way to do good. And and that was back in 2001 when Social Capital Partners was formed. Um, and it seemed obvious in 2001, seems even more obvious in 2020, this notion that governments write checks and we solve social problems. 
didn't look like necessarily the most efficient or most sustainable way to do that. And it also seemed surprising that, uh, you know, we divided this world into silos as if here's what business does, here's what nonprofits do, here's what the government does, as if there was no intersection. Everybody in their own sector doing their own things. Um, and yet it seemed like the most creative solutions would be at the intersection of so the whole idea behind social capital partners was, could we find more sustainable ways to solve structural social challenges? Could we kind of combine market forces and doing good in a model? And why don't we pick a particular structural social challenge and see if we can't uh, find more sustainable ways to do that? And, and the one we picked was, back in 2001 was how do we find meaningful employment? Are there better ways to find meaningful employment for people who face employment barriers? Single moms, new immigrants, at-risk youth, people with physical or mental disabilities. And that's the journey we've been on with many twists and turns along the way. Amazing. And can you give us an example of some of those programs that, that uh, Social Capital Partners has put in place? Well, I can, I can give you a sense of the journey and maybe, you know, we've had kind of four distinct phases and we'll probably talk mostly about phase four in this because it's about the next economy and it's about uh, the vision we have for that. But we started with something that would be very familiar to uh, CSI and, and CSI's community in social enterprise. So the whole first phase was let's help start up businesses that do this as part of their DNA, but where um, our first lens, we kind of were a social venture capital organization trying to support businesses, but our first lens was, there's Tanya. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I was you trying to shut me up, Bill. I'm pretty sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> it was karma. <laughs> Don't get angry, get even. That's my <laughs> motto. All right, Tanya, I'm gonna, we just covered uh, a little bit about social capital partners and we were talking about some specific projects and I will uh, hand the microphone back to you, so to speak. <laughs> Thanks, B, but, but carry on, Bill. I, I'm sure it was right in the middle of it. Well, we were on sort of first phase of social capital partners. So I was talking about that was our social enterprise phase where, um, you know, what we were doing was we we'll say, we'll invest in businesses and that investment could be a loan or it could be, it could be a grant if it was a if it was a nonprofit. It could be an equity if it was a for profit. But our first criteria was the majority of employees had to be from a disadvantaged population. Uh, after that, we started to say, well, is this a viable business? What's its five year cash flow look like? What's its management team? Does it have a differentiated product or service? I won't go into lots of things uh, in terms of what we did in that phase, but a phase that we loved. Um, we did things everything from uh, uh, a couple of loans to uh, an organization in Vancouver called the Tierra Property Management. It's owned by a charity that helps women who are victims of violence. Today, it does the property management services for dozens of condominium properties in uh, BC, including 15 of BC housing single accommodation residences. Uh, it's run by licensed commercial property managers, but uh, the admin jobs go to the women affiliated with the charity as their first step back into the mainstream, and a lot of the on-site security maintenance jobs go to men who are living in the single accommodation residences who are often recovering from some form of chemical dependency. So it today employs more than 200 people, is profitable. That's the kind of thing we did in our first phase and I won't go into others, but we did everything from west to east, a renovation company in Winnipeg that employed urban aboriginals from the inner city neighborhoods of Winnipeg. Bicycle Courier Company here in Toronto to hire directly from youth shelters, uh, 18 thrift stores in Montreal. Uh, that's a charity that hired right off the social assistance rolls. Last year had revenue in of 35 million and profits of almost 5 million. So those were the kinds of things we did in our first phase. Um, I've, it's funny how in these... Uh, you know, this description, I leave out our failures, but I know you're going to get me on that. Uh, get you know that's failures. coming. Uh, so, <laughs> so I will talk about that. But what we learned from that phase was uh, two things. One, um, you know, you can make double bottom line companies work. They can work both financially, they can be uh, profitable and sustainable, and they can work socially. They can transform lives. Um, mm -hmm. 
But we stepped back and said, but the challenge is um, what we think we are is an interesting magazine article. People mm -hmm. like to write about it. They like to pat us on the head and tell us to keep up the good work. But at the end of the day, they're reading about this on a Saturday and going to work on Monday, doing things exactly the same ways that they were doing before. And so while we love the social enterprise phase and we couldn't be proud of the organizations we were affiliated with and working with, we said, we're not gonna change this economic landscape unless we involve the mainstream engines of commerce. So that's why we moved on from that phase. Why don't, why don't I pause there? Just well, no, and I think that's great. Two or, or, uh... Well, I, I think I remember when I first heard your name, Bill, uh, almost 16 years ago, you had just put out a social enterprise competition and it was the galvanizing and shocking uh, moment. I think you and I laughed because you didn't expect there to be like 200 responses and so many people, but it really was an interesting moment because it marked the beginning uh, or the, re, the reigniting of, um, of a field that was sitting latent in Canada. And all of a sudden, we now were starting to talk about bringing together economic and social impact. And that, was, that was a critical uh, and, and phenomenal moment in our history. Uh, and so I don't wanna, I really do think it's important to recognize that your work stimulated a whole movement um, and brought together other movements uh, from community economic development, local economic development, and then starting to see this shifting into the social finance space. So why don't you tell us about how you also led the way in, in some of those areas, because those were some of my favorite failures. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I'll start with, a, yeah, you know, what, what was a success, and it will build to its denouement of the many yeah. uh, uh, failures that, that we've had. And I think we're going to get explicitly a conversation about failures because I, uh, I, I do want to chat about the philosophy of failing um, too. Um, but we moved from social enterprise. What we, what we sort of challenged ourselves was we said, if we're going to change the economic landscape, we've got to do th two things. And we said, one, we got to engage the private sector. Because up mm -hmm. until then, if you like, we've been mining for deal flow for social enterprise primarily in the nonprofit sector. Because the nonprofit sector got it. You know, they, they said, and, and they came up with great ideas in terms of viable business plans, et cetera. But we said, we're gonna remain an interesting magazine article if we don't engage the private sector. And we said, the second thing we gotta do is we gotta make this more cookie cutter. Because startups are hard. Startups are arguably even harder with this model that we've got. And we can only do one deal a year because we have to drop everything we're doing to say, how do we get this business to work? With that, we said private sector cookie cutter. We said, what about franchising? What about this idea? Why don't we go to establish successful franchise operations where we don't have to figure out the business model, which was such a challenge in phase one, with this idea, which is we said, we'll provide any of your franchisees or, or business owners who, who own franchises attractive financing. We'll make it subordinate to their bank debt. We'll do it at attractive rates. But to get our money, they got to agree to implement a community hiring program. They got to agree that a fixed number of their employees will be hired through these community service agencies we work with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we knew that would get the antenna of business owners up. Like, well, wait a sec, who, who are you going to make me hire? I mean, what's, you know, I don't, I don't know if I like this. Um, so we said, but our promise back to you, the business owner, is we'll find you uh, a qualified pool of candidates to choose from. And we said, we don't deliver on that promise. You don't have to deliver in your promise to hire the fixed number. And you're the sole judge. You only have to do this once. You can opt out at any time after that. Cancel the social covenant of this loan without any penalty. And you're, you're home scot-free. So we, we thought, let's guarantee our product. Mm -hmm. We joke now. We had no idea if we could do it. But we thought, let's make it look like we know what we're doing. And, <laughs> and, and we got to de-risk this anyway. Uh, so let's just de-risk it and see what happens. So we did 80 of those. Um, it's like everything, a long story, as you well know. Um, uh, mostly in the car service area, Active Green and Ross, Mr. Lube were our big ones. Uh, we like the car service model just because, uh, by the way, you don't need that many skills uh, to change oil. Although, as I always joke, it immediately eliminates me. <laughs> but you can work your way up to being a licensed mechanic. So our criteria in terms of looking for the franchise 
organizations we wanted to pick was A, they had to be financially successful because we wanted to prove that these loans would be repaid, et cetera. Two, they had to be labor intensive rather than capital intensive because we didn't see ourselves as a lender. We saw ourselves as you know, a community hirer. And, and uh, so we didn't want to put too much financing for every job. So we had a criteria of, we had to get at least one job for every $15,000 of financing we provided. And the third thing we had as a criteria was we want a good career path. We don't want a dead end job, which is why we like. So, so we, we put all that criteria together and then target ones. We had the most success in car service area. Uh, we actually, from a social finance innovation, we actually tied our interest rates to the number of community hires. So each community hire they made, their interest rate went down. If they let one go, we raised their interest rates. So as opposed to tying it to prime, our interest rates were tied to our social outcome. So brilliant. Yeah, and we did 80 of those. And, uh, and again, learnings that led us to the next phase. But, but I'll pause there for... So, I mean, that, I, I wanna know why you didn't just keep going. Yeah. So the reason we didn't keep going is we learned two things from doing that. One, employers would implement a community hiring program if someone made it easy for them. And two, it wasn't easy for them. And it wasn't easy for them because um, I feel like the way product gets to market in our employment training system is literally through thousands of community service agencies um, whose training and background is primarily as social workers. They don't speak the language of business. They think naturally their customer is the person they're trying to find an employment opportunity for but don't think of the employer on that same way. And they think they're in a transaction relationship with employers where they send candidates spaghetti at the wall to job postings, not in a strategic relationship where they sit down with that employer and say, hey, owner of an active green Ross, what makes for a successful lube tech in your business? What are the characteristics? Where are your pain points? We'll solve those. So we were playing the interface between, if you like, the demand side and the supply side. And guess how many of the 80 that we did this for opted out and canceled and said, you didn't get as good enough candidates? Zero. And it's not because we always found them the perfect candidates, because when we didn't, we said, we got to fix it. It's not your job to employ someone who can't do the job out of some sense of community obligation. It was our job to get you the right candidate in the first place. So we'll respond as fast or faster than any other recruitment agency you deal with. Well, guess what? You do that. They roll with the punches. Well, they said, of course, we'll keep hiring you. You get that this is, you, you have to solve our problem and you're responding at the speed with which we need in order to make our business work. So our insight in this whole thing was to treat them as a customer. And if you treated them as a customer, they responded. In fact, Active Green and Ross said to us, okay, we want to use your uh, community hiring uh, program in our company owned stores. We don't need your financing. Right. So, wait a second. We thought we needed the financing as the carrot and stick to make this whole thing happen. We offer you the carrot of attractive financing. We got the stick of we call your loan if you don't do it. And they said, no, you found us access to a labor pool we never would have had access to. They're working out. It's the right thing to do for the community. Why wouldn't we do it? So, so basically you made yourself obsolete. Well, we, we, we succeeded and you became, you made yourself. Well, the, it was a little different than that because we said, yeah, we can do five or 600 of these, but we're playing a Band-Aid in the mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. Instead of playing the Band-Aid, let's try and fix the system. Let's, mm -hmm. let's actually get up to the systems level. And now we're getting into where, <laughs> you know, uh, yes. Uh, some go, of the, go ahead. I can save, I'm going to save the failure question for, for after this one, because I know you're going to tell us about the next stage, and I think it's such an amazing story. Well, it's, it's, um, it is, an amazing story, but there is a lot of failure in this okay. next phase because. Well then, so let's 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 ask the question then because I think I think one of the things that I love most about you, and there are so many, Bill, but one of the things that I love most about you is that you are so brutally honest about what has worked and what has failed and why, and your unrelenting passion to get at the systems change is unparalleled. Like it's it's just amazing. But I find so few of us. Um, are comfortable with that process. And so I, I just love to hear 
what you feel that honesty takes and what are you looking for and how do you approach this pr this process of continually like just even to be able to say we were just a cute magazine article like that is you know sometimes i feel like i get caught in that all the time like how do you keep yourself going and reflective what do you bring to that yeah well i mean I, i'd start with um you know one of the things that i mean you, you know when you we build it into the way you are trying to operate so we are a non-profit with uh with independent funding which is huge mm. doesn't care about failure right. so that means we should be trying stuff that nobody else is trying and mm. that is inherently really really hard and then if you say that you say to yourself well that means i gotta fail at a lot of things uh we are going to fail because we're trying stuff that nobody else is going to try and that's our role and it actually makes it much easier if you say that's your role, because when you actually don't succeed at it, you say, well, this is what we were expecting, you know, <laughs> quit whining, you know, like and saying this is hard. The whole point is it's supposed to be hard and you're right. supposed to be doing things that, and you are one of the few lucky ones that can do it because you've got this independent funding where so many nonprofit organizations don't. They have to figure out how to meet payroll next week. They have to figure out, and they have to, in some ways, become a little bit beholden to what funders will fund. Uh, and, and funders, most funders, don't like funding things that aren't working. So the tendency is, let's do things that will work and will be a success at. And we sort of flip that script and say, no, no, we're not succeeding unless we're failing which is brilliant construct because then your own incompetence of all of a sudden makes you look like you're really doing well. And it's, it's, it's kind of a, you know, it, it, people say, God, that guy's good at what he does. He's really good at what he does. He's totally incompetent. Talk about managing expectations. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's, it is a, and so we don't actually look at failure or success as failure or success. We're trying to get to as much impact as possible to make the biggest difference possible. So if I say the thing that I'm proudest about in Social Capital Partners, which would, in a way you alluded to in that remark about the mag magazine article, we'll move away from our successes as easily as we'll move away from our failures because we see that there's more impact to be had. We love social enterprise. We, we, we couldn't have been happier about the organizations we were with. They were very successful but we knew we weren't going to change the landscape and that's what was driving us. And, and we didn't need to be successful and we didn't need to, we needed to say, how do we transform this economic landscape uh, in, in the most powerful, you know, equal, you know, um, way. I mean, you know, how do we solve inequality? How do we, you know, and, and, if, if we saw that what we were doing wasn't going to get us there, whether it was branded a success or failure, it didn't matter to us. Uh, to us, it's, it's kind of like a maze. And, and in the center of the maze is the magic of the biggest impact you could possibly have. And to get to the center, you've got to hit a lot of dead ends to get there. Those are your failures. You just don't want to hit the same one all the time, which you know, sometimes you feel like you're doing. But, but but we don't think of it. You, you need to hit those to get to the center. And, and uh, so we've never looked at failure or success as either failure or success. We look upon it as just part of the roadmap on the way to have the most impact we possibly can have. And we, you know, on a regular basis say, is this the route to get there? And, and if it isn't, we, we change and, and, and success and failure has nothing to do with it in, in, in many ways, you know, in, in conventional definitions of those. Yeah. And I think, and I mean, I think that's an incredibly uh, privileged position to be able to be able to have the resources to be able to do this. But there's also something that I think you've said in your comments here, and I know that you've challenged me about personally, um, which is around the role of uh, the corporate sector and the mainstream business. And you know, when you moved from the nonprofit social enterprise space into working with the, the you know, Active Greener Ross and, and the, 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 um, that field, um, 
And then, you know, you told me last summer, you know, Tanya, if you're not working with the corporate sector, you're not going to be able to affect the change. And I think that was a really important thing. And I know you're, you've got some really interesting and new stories to share, but I do want to reflect just for a minute. Like, you know, we get a lot of criticism at the Center for Social Innovation that we're maybe not, it's so funny, you know, the, the right wing calls us commie HQ and the left wing thinks that we're capitalist pigs and we're constantly trying to balance these different, these different ideas and, you know, environment and economy, social economy, like these two concepts, um, you know, I think the, the diametric opposition of these is such a challenge for us. And I see so much of the work you're doing, trying to kind of find those nuggets of systems change in the intersection of these. And I, you know, as we're moving into this, you know, recovery, resilience, recovery, or green recovery, and, and we're moving towards it uh, in an unrelenting pace, the impossible is becoming possible. UBI is actually here with the CERB. You know, one of the things that I think is so important for us is to really get down to the, the, the what are the specific systems changes that we want to see that are going to unlock the, um, the movement of these corporate worlds into social impact. I think we're seeing it, but tell us some of the, so where you went next, because I'm, I'm very interested in, the, in, in where you guys are right now in terms of your workforce and, and uh, uh, planning and, and employment transformation. Yeah, and I'd like to get to where we're going, so don't let me spend too much time, because the next one really is our, you know, fill, filled with failures um, in, in the conventional sense of, of that. And we really went to saying, let's work at a systems level. What's missing, what the system has missed, is uh, it, it's completely supply-led in terms of our employment training system, not demand-led. So it is never understood, the system is never understood. We have to treat the employer as important a customer in the system as the person we're trying to find an employment opportunity for. The system has missed the point. If this isn't an easy and effective recruitment channel for employers to hire through, it actually doesn't matter what you do on the supply side. You will have very suboptimal dysfunctional system. And we thought, wait, we've got data here. We gave 80 different business owners. We said you can opt out at any time with no penalty. There, there is no, and every single one of them stayed in. And the only insight we had, this eureka moment, we treated them as a customer. I mean, you know, that was, but we realized the system hadn't figured that out. And we thought, boy, we spend billions of dollars on employment training for as taxpayers. Uh, employers aren't involved in the design of that training. That training isn't linked to our future workforce development needs. Right. And none of the funding in the system is tied to successful employment outcomes, which is what both the demand side and the supply side want. So we actually spent six or seven years working at a systems level, trying to uh, implement demand-led system change at government levels. It's a long story. I will be in therapy for years. Um, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's like, we could spend all the time on that story. It, it is fascinating. It is fascinating. I've learned so much. I do want to talk about what we're doing next because it's, it's really, because I really do think we're on, the, but, but it's, and it's, things have changed. It's not like it's a, a, a complete total failure in terms of our success, story. but we haven't got to where, you know, the system is now what we call the demand led system. And, and, and it's, it, it's, it's maddening in many ways. It's much more in the language. You, you find that governments are willing to do pilots um, because pilots get your innovation badge and things like that. So we got all kinds of pilots done on this and they'd be very successful. But to actually go through the transformation of actually implementing a demand-led system and what that meant, um, it, it was, you know, you need a whole bunch of institutional courage uh, to do that. And it's not a vote winner. It's too complicated an issue. So trying to find the actual willingness, and we came close in various places, in close in Manitoba, which is a fascinating story. And, and so th there are ways, and there are people taking on this baton now. I mean, sometimes with our so-called failures, what we think we're doing is we go at it for a period of time. We know it's still the right thing to do. Demand-led is much more in the language now than it used to be. There's much more interest in it. And there's others to carry it on, but 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 we've ended up with a different idea that we think is more powerful. 
that has meant, okay, let's dedicate one of our resources, Judy Doidge, who's wonderful, fantastic, knows all kinds and huge demand in, in terms of people who are trying to carry this demand-led lens on through the way governments do it, and governments are interested. So it's, it's not like, but boy, uh, it is, it is. I'm consuming. Hard and time consuming. And, time consuming and, and I'm relenting. But so tell us where you are now. Tell us the big project that you're working on around employee ownership. I'm super excited about this. Yeah, no, on this one we're super excited about, which is which is great. You know, I think we had a Eureka moment uh, three years ago, coincidental with John Shell joining, who's wonderful and who you uh, know of the work he's been doing on small businesses. Um, you know, which has been really important uh, work. Uh, um, but this Eureka moment was we said, uh, we looked at the whole inequality issue and saying, you know, just about all the solutions to inequality are on the income side of mm -hmm. inequality rather than on the wealth side of inequality, mm -hmm. including what social capital partners have been working on for our first, you know, 15 or 16 years. We were finding meaningful employment, which is hugely important, but it's an income solution. Just as the other, in most of the other solutions are things like universal basic income, or there, you know, get a real fair minimum wage law in place, or they are let's change the tax system and tax the rich more and redistribute and have a broader social safety net. Those are income solutions. They're all good solutions. Nothing bad about any of them, and I'm an advocate for all of them. But the trouble with income solutions is the first unexpected event like a pandemic that comes into the, ben the lives of a beneficiary of one of these income solutions, they're back at square one because right. they've got no wealth resilience. And we kind of said to ourselves, we gotta solve the wealth side. Nobody is really working on the wealth side. And we had an idea and we were researching that idea. And in researching that idea, we came across this fascinating sort of arc and history and legislation in the US that has been encouraging, uh, that has created powerful incentives around encouraging 100% employee owned businesses. Yep. They're referred to as ESOPs in the US. We think an ESOP is an employee stock ownership plan, which a whole bunch of public companies have, you know, where three to 5% of their stock can be, you know, be in an option pool or something like that. ESOPs in the US actually refer to this particular form of organizational structure that employees own 100% of. What's fascinating about this, two uh, huge incentives around this. One, if you're a business owner and sell to 100% owned ESA, you can defer and in most cases completely eliminate your capital gains tax. Hmm. That's a big incentive. Big. Bigger incentive is if you actually operate 100% owned ESA uh, that makes, meets all the regulatory requirements, and those regulatory requirements mean you distribute the shares proportionally, not disproportionately to senior management. So most ESOPs, for instance, are structured in a way um, that says, uh, we'll distribute proportional to your salary with a cap, say, at 150,000. So uh, someone making 50,000 might get a third of the shares of someone making 150,000, but they'd also get a third of the shares of someone making 500,000 if it was a big company right. firm. Um, so if they're distributed proportionally, you as a company, 100%, pay no income tax. Huh. Well, that's a huge incentive. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. And we thought, well, that's interesting. Why aren't there more of these? And we looked into this. Turns out there's 6,500 ESOPs in the US. Uh, Rutgers has done the research on these and compared them to their traditionally owned peers in the same kind of uh, uh, field. Turns out ESOPs grow faster. Hmm. They're more profitable. They default less. And they pay their employees more before you take into account the wealth creation from the share ownership. Wow. And when you take into account the wealth ownership from the share, what wealth generation from the share ownership, they are powerful wealth generating vehicles. There is, for instance, one in headquartered in Idaho that's been around for years now um, that has, it's a grocery company, uh, has created 400 frontline millionaires of, of people who were cashiers or 
uh, stocking shelves. I mean, very powerful vehicles. Um, and, you know, as I say, they're, they're, and some large companies, if anyone, uh, or not, not that anyone goes, travels anywhere these days anymore, but, but for those people who escaped uh, Canadian winters in the old days and went to Florida, for instance, Publix, they will have shopped at a Publix, which is the largest grocery store in Florida, 100% employee owned. Um, you know, just th there are these companies will go, wait a sec, what is going on here? Why aren't there more of these? And why in, uh, um, you know, last year we looked at data of all the sales transactions that took place. 5,000 went to private equity and 200 went to ESOPs. And of those 200, uh, more than 70% had 100 employees or less. So they're taking a fraction of the total, if you like, economic transformational pie that's going on. And yet, it would be good, not just for wealth generation, but for our GNP if we did, because they grow faster, they're more profitable. They, and by the way, in things like uh, the last two recessions, um, 2008, 2009, et cetera, uh, they uh, laid off far fewer people in that period. So, I mean, just in terms of what we want, in terms of the economy, here's something powerful. And we said, why is this? And, and we realized there's no mainstream institutions financing these. There's, there's com complex regulation around ESOPs that isn't nearly as complex as most people think it is, but it's meant uh, people in mainstream institutions think, uh, you know, this is too complicated. And, and we thought, the way most ESOPs are financed, which is why so few of them are actually going to ESOPs as opposed to private equity, mm -hmm. is on day zero of creating an ESOP, your balance sheet is 0% uh, equity and 100% debt. Because the other great thing about ESOPs is employees don't pay for this. There's no downside to employees. So the day that the, the transaction takes place and the company is sold to employees, Employees don't pay anything. They actually don't own the shares. It's owned by an ESOP trustee on their behalf. And the ESOP trustee then appoints boards, etc. And the way they're financed is if you sell the business, if you're an owner selling the business, uh, you might get a bank to say, okay, you've got some receivables and inventory, etc. That will cover 30% of the transaction via a loan. And the vendor the owner takes back 70% in a vendor note that is paid off over the profits over 10 or 15 years over time. These are, these are to transition existing entrepreneur led businesses into employee owned businesses. Is that, prime, that's, is that a hundred percent of those or that's the, um, the largely the, per, the way it works? It can, it, it can work in a number of ways, but that's, that's, you know, particularly thinking about the opportunity right now, we think about, well, there's a silver tsunami in the sense there's all kinds right. of business owners who are in their 60s are looking to sell their business. How do we prevent this from going to private equity? How do we get them into ESOPs? Why aren't there a lot more of them going? Because this is a powerful vehicle in multiple, multiple ways. And yeah. why, why don't people know about this? You know, why do, do you talk to any mainstream financial people who are in M&A work? Never heard of them. Mm -hmm. and, and we think, well, and part of what, from a business owner right now, if they sell the private equity, private equity says, we'll write you a check for 80% of the business right up front. You might have to take 20% as a hold back or an earn out, but you're out in three to four years. Whereas right now with the financing alternatives in place, if you sell into an ESOP, uh, you might get 30% cash by way of what the bank was willing to put in, but you're, that's all, because you're now getting a note back that's going to be paid out over all the profits. So, and you think, well, that's just too big a gap. I'm just going to take the easy route and sell to, um, if, if someone even tells you about ESOPs. That's right. And, and, but, you know, we thought, wait a second, they don't pay any income tax. They can handle way more debt. Nobody's providing what's called mezzanine debt, which yeah. is often in private equity deals, how private equity finances theirs, and they bring mezzanine debt in. But because there's no equity, because mezzanine debt follows private equity, nobody's bringing in the mezzanine debt and nobody understands it. And, and, and we think, holy smokes, here's a huge opportunity to actually 
bring in mezzanine debt for 20 to 30% of this transaction, get business owners 50 to 60% in cash, with the capital gains elimination, now they're on the same footing as they would be if they sold the private equity with a way better legacy. They keep the so, job. So, in the so Bill, you're going to, so SEP is going to provide that mezzanine financing. That's the piece what? that you guys are looking at. No, but close. We're okay. saying, there is that. How do we get institutional capital to do this? Because uh, Oh, clever other people's money. Good job. What, what the big opportunity is, I mean, SCP doesn't have much money in, in the global sense to make big change. Right. But pension funds. Ooh, okay. And wait a sec. Aren't pension funds, shouldn't they be thinking of themselves as the stewards of the wealth of the 99%? Isn't that maybe what should be the goal of a Canada pension plan or a, and wouldn't this be an ideal vehicle? And by the way, pension plans, we think we can get you risk adjusted rates of return. You don't have to sacrifice anything in the way because these companies default less. They're, you know, they can take another 20% into the capital stack without you having to be concerned at all. You do that in private equity deals all the time. You put mezzanine debt into those. And by the way, Often those hollow out communities move jobs offshore, et cetera. So if you okay. really thought of yourselves as the stewards of the wealth of the 99%, rather than the narrow you know, group of beneficiaries you serve, which you've served well, this is an ideal uh, vehicle for you. So we managed, when we're thinking all this, uh, there was a pension plan that knocked on our door, said, uh, we're starting to hear about impact investment. You guys know something about that. Got any ideas? I said, well, <laughs> Matter of fact, yeah, we got one. And in effect, we got them to say, okay, we're not convinced that these market opportunities exist, that nobody's figured out or whatever, because aren't markets efficient and aren't capital markets, you know, you know. But tell you what, here are our parameters. Uh, this is what we would need to see in a deal. Our minimum check size is 25 million. We need to see EBITDA of this. We need to see this kind of track record of the company. We need to get this kind of interest rate. Here are our parameters. See if you can find us anything. We'll give you a $100 million hunting license. So we are off pre-pandemic. Uh, um, we actually had a signed term sheet on a deal in LA, uh, which is a fascinating story. Um, sadly, um, you know, uh, back to square one on it because it was an event management security company. Oh no. oh, no. So it did all, you know, the security event management for things like large concerts, uh, NFL games, Rose Bowls, that kind of thing. So you can imagine what their business is. But, but, but the arc of this is what makes this idea so exciting. Because we, we got this. We're a nonprofit from Canada. It's never done an ESOP deal before. And now we've got a hunting license. We think, okay, we got to go in and we're going to do it in the U.S. Our goal, by the way, let's show that this can happen in the U.S. Then how do we bring this to Canada? How do we get this legislation in Canada? So that's one of yeah, the... Yeah, I want to talk about that in a second. How do we convert way more transactions instead of going to private equity going here? Because it, and if we can harness institutional capital, so why don't we just prove, if we can use this $100 million to prove that there is this market hole, then we can... I mean, there's hundreds of billions of institutional capital that should be going this way to, to this. So we thought, we've got to prove we can do a deal. Um, we got to prove there is this hole. How do we, a nonprofit in Canada, go into the US? Never done an ESOP deal. But, but if you say with confidence, we got 100 million bucks, people pay attention. <laughs> and, and what was interesting about this company in the LA, the owner started this business when he'd been in his 20s. He was a student at USC. He looks like he should be in the security business because. Uh, you could fit two of me inside him and he doesn't have an ounce of fat on him. In fact, you could probably fit two of me in his neck, but, but I mean, you know, so he looks like he should be in the security business, but halfway through the process, he, he's 70s. He says, I've got to sell the business. He's going through a conventional process when someone tells him about ESOPs. And he said, holy smokes, I built this business off the bats of my employees and I could stay in this. And um, we were actually brought in by the senior debt provider uh, he met us and said, okay, I want to work exclusively with these guys because he loved our mission, what we're trying to do and why. Because we said, we're not going to negotiate on our behalf. We're going to negotiate on your employees' behalf, you know, in terms of, you know, John and I, we don't need any more money, but, but uh, you know, we're, so 
it was interesting. We got a signed term sheet on it. You think of what that would have done. I mean, they had 30,000 employees. Those are people in security, wow. man management, et cetera. Those are people who could never have built wealth themselves in terms. Of, it was a perfect example of what we're trying to do and the power of this idea. So not surprisingly, we, we signed the term sheet and it was supposed to close April 30th. And of course, you know, it was subject to due diligence. Well, of course, it's not going to close because their businesses and, and uh, but we're so excited about the idea and the possibility. And this is probably a long winded way of explaining this and sorry to take up so much time. But in terms of creating wealth in, in a powerful way, transforming the economy in terms of what it it could look like and it's better for everyone these companies grow faster they are more profitable they pay their employees more i mean it's it's exactly what we're looking for in terms of a society and there are it should be a perfect fit uh for pension funds and imagine if you could convert you know take those 5,000 have gone to private equity versus virtually nothing to esops and significantly change that equation very, very powerful. And that's what we're so excited about. Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's contagious. I'm ready. Let's do it. I can't, I can't wait to do more. And I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm always blown away by how you pull the pieces together. And I actually love how you keep government out of that one, uh, right? Because what happens is that you actually have been able to find the alignment, the win-win. I know we're not allowed to say it, you know, the uh, winners take all, not win-win-win, but it does feel that way, right? You've got, you're, you're really starting to redesign those systems but why is it and what exactly is the tax incentive the tax credit system in the united states and why don't we have it in canada because you said canada is one of the few jurisdictions that doesn't support this and yet i know our friends at university of waterloo sean Gobi and his team are working hard looking at this question of succession planning and the role of cooperatives and just talk to me about the canadian context and why it's such a dog's breakfast well we're chatting with sean and and uh um but but you know one of the other things we're doing i mean particularly what 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 we've used this time when you know everything was put on hold although the nice thing is we have an active deal on the go again uh now so we'll see what happens uh with that still early days but but things are starting to open up uh again and uh and we do believe we do believe post pandemic there's just going to be more interest in this kind of thing because so many of us have now had a stark realization of how, you know, how unequal outcomes are, uh, particularly in something like this. Um, so, you know, I think the window is going to open up. We thought, okay, if we're not working on deals, you know, in March in terms of our, you know, our particular deal that we thought we were going to close at the end of April, going by the wayside, what do we do? And so we are actively saying, okay, Let's actually take this time to say, how do we get this uh, legislation in Canada? What would a in-Canada solution look like? Let's not just look at what's happened in the U.S., but in other parts of the world. So researching what they've done in sort of other parts and say, what would a, you know, made in Canada solution look like? Um, we are actually working with uh, an organization putting together a white paper on this. Um, we hope to have that out in sort of June, circulate that inside government and outside government, get input. What we like about ESOPs that are different than say co-ops, um, and Canada's had a pretty strong sort of co-op movement, et cetera, but co-ops are, uh, institutional capital is scared by co-ops. They're scared by, um, you know, kind of the governance and, you know, democratic ownership structure of it. Uh, Whereas the thing about ESOPs, which has made it so much more appealing potentially to institutional capital, is it's the governance structure they're familiar with. This isn't about all the employees on the board. An ESOP trustee holds the shares on behalf of the employees and then appoints an independent board. And, and you know, there can still be the same sort of governance structure that institutional capital is both familiar with and comfortable with that makes this a more powerful opportunity to actually be transformative in terms of the size of capital that could be devoted to it. So those are amongst the things we're, we're working on to say, and we've got some interest in government circles in terms of this. I, I joke, you know, we've, we've now got a minister 
uh, for middle class prosperity. Well, they can't have any open files. <laughs> no, they've got to be trying to find some stuff to do. Um, you, you know, uh, and so we think sort of the timing on this is pretty exciting and uh, and powerful. And early, early days. Nobody knows anything about these in uh, Canadian government, so it will take a while. They're more familiar with co-op structures, but but again, we'll. Does we'll it mean the government bill in Canada could could a could a uh, could a small business or a business do this right now just through their own independent legal? Like it doesn't need a legislation. Yeah. And we're it? looking at that too. And there's a couple of structures in Canada that have tried this. There's actually an ESOP association that tried to get this going in Canada. Um, Oh, about 15 or 20 years ago in, in uh, this. I think, you know, what we're bringing to the table, which uh, might, you, you know, both in terms of, I think the timing's better now, just in terms of, and, and the fact that we've got institutional capital actually interested. And if we start to do a couple of deals in the U.S. that we say we're doing these in the U.S. because we don't have this in Canada, um, but by the way, here's the research, here's what it does, here's why it's powerful, here's why, and this should fit. And, and we think it's a perfect fit for pension funds. If we could, you know, they really, I mean, I believe they should be thinking of themselves as the stewards of the wealth of the 99%, and what could be a better investment opportunity than this? So I think there's a way the stars can all align. You know, I'm uh, always an optimist. I always believe these things are very doable. Um, our track record doesn't entirely prove that, but 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 it but it also proves you know um, you can get extraordinary things done, and and we believe the timing's right on this, and and that it's really really you know very exciting. Yeah, I, I'm 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 totally psyched about it. I love it, and I think it's um, reflective of of you know one major sort of component that we've been watching from Mondragon and the co-op movement and. In, uh, in Europe, and then looking at the incredibly depth, incredible depth of cooperative movements here in Ontario or in Canada. But it's interesting because I do like that mix of the kind of for-profit social purpose. You know, I think that's got a lot of legs there and will make investors feel more excited. But I have to say, pension funds, the stewards of the wealth of the 99% now built. Now, if we could get that put on a big billboard exactly. somewhere, that would be exactly. phenomenal. So let's turn our attention because I'm aware of time and I, I do want to give you um, yeah, two more questions. But just tell us, because you've also been doing advocacy with the Give Five campaign. So super briefly, just tell us what your, what your perspective is on, on, on the role of foundations and where they're at. And because and, this is one of my favorites. Go ahead. Have to separate the two things. Um, yeah, it's the other side now. We're on the other side now. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I got to, you know, give five, which is, um, you know, just it's it was meant to be a short term thing. Uh, Giving Tuesday was made to be on May fifth because we needed to do something now. It's normally the Tuesday after American Thanksgiving as the antidote to sort of Black Friday, which is the shopping spree, let's then, you know, on Tuesday, think about life again. And yeah, but what is the purpose of it? Let's give something back. And Giving Tuesday said, well, let's uh, actually accelerate that this year um, because, you know, the pandemic has made it, we've got to do something fast. Right. And so there were a few of us that said, well, what can foundations do fast? And, and um, I don't know, you know, for listeners out there, uh, you know, the way foundations work is uh, a, someone gives money to a foundation and under our regulation of foundations, uh, foundations have to give away uh, at least three and a half percent of that money every year to charity um, with the notion that they invest the rest and then have more to give away in future. But our, what is called the disbursement quota requires them to give three and a half percent every year to charity. Um, and so a quick, fast, three-week initiative that said, why don't we get into, you know, something foundations can do to respond, which is instead of giving three and a half, to give five. So we created a give five. It, it works out that if foundations actually, if all foundations actually gave five, uh, I mean, a bunch of foundations already give five, 
So you wouldn't get any increment from that. So this was just the number that would happen if those that were giving less than five gave five this year would contribute $700 million to the sector. So let's just get a movement around that. This should be an easy thing to say yes to. I have a lot of other views that are harder for foundations to say oh, yes to. Give it, give it um, to us, give us the 100% version. Come on, let's hear the one. Okay, so the 100% version. Percent version. Yeah. Um, one of my beliefs um, is, well, yeah, I, don't think, I, I don't think foundation construct is good public policy. So in, in terms of someone like me can start a foundation, get a significant tax break, let's say 50 cents on the dollar, to start a foundation. So we as society forego immediately 50 cents that could have been put to good. And what do we get back as society? Well, we get a commitment that three and a half cents will come back every year via disbursement quota. That's the disbursement quota. So we're foregoing 50 cents today and we're getting a three and a half cent annuity back, which sounds not very good, but it sounds worse when you say, and foundations have the freedom to take that other 96 and a half cents and invest it wherever they want tax-free. So they can invest it in, you know, if they wanted to, gun manufacturers or fossil fuel, or, but they typically invest it in conventional investments that, that aren't concerned with making the world a better place. And I think that's a terrible deal for society. That's bad public policy. And we've been so excited about this $800 million of social finance that the government's come up with, as, as we should be in terms of this. But I think, wait a sec, there's $80 billion, right. $80 billion in foundations that are being invested wherever they want. Mm -hmm. I mean, what should be the capital source for affordable housing or social enterprise or, Tanya, community bonds? Mm -hmm. um, exactly. and, and why aren't we requiring that? Yeah. And the government's trying to find ideas. So I floated one that said, hey, government, I got one for you. It won't cost you a cent. We'll marshal way more than 800 million. You don't have to choose where you put the money at all. Just announce today that 10 years from now, you're going to start taxing the investment earnings of foundations that aren't invested in impact. Gives us 10 years to figure out what impact is and define it. 10 years for foundations to recalibrate their investment portfolios without fire sales. But it would marshal today, the announcement would marshal today, everyone saying, okay, we got to get at this. And you would see $80 billion. And Bill, that would make it full circle. From the very first SCP project, you will have then, if you can convince the government to do that, what you'll have done is you'll have actually created the market that could sustain all of those nonprofit social mission, social venture initiatives by creating the funds that would then create those virtuous yeah. circles and those yeah. healthy economic systems. Yeah. And that's why and I think government, you could do, I mean, this is so painful, this 800 million. I mean, it's great and everything, but here's an idea. It doesn't cost you a cent. Right. It would marshal it right away. In fact, it'd bring in money. You don't have to choose. I mean, it's, and it makes sense. And it's unlocking. So my, I had two questions, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna combine them. You've already given us so many amazing ideas for what kinds of laws and policies we need changed, right? I mean, the ESOP stuff, the, the, the complete radical uh, reform of foundations, which I, of course, absolutely, absolutely love. And we've, we've touched on a, a, a bunch of uh, things, but I think one of the things that a lot of people are, um, dealing with right now is, you know, we don't know how COVID-19 is going to affect us exactly. Um, I know that John uh, has, John Chanel has done, uh, launched the Save Small Business campaign and has actually been very instrumental and effective in addressing the issues of rents. And I know that CSI will certainly be, uh, and a lot of other organizations will be, will benefit from that. But I think, I think it's fair to say that we're heading smack dab into a recession and likely a depression. And I don't think a lot of us have actually been through this uh, in the past. And, and um, you know, I'm watching campaign after campaign for a resilient recovery, a green recovery, a, a just recovery. We're talking UBI, we're talking climate, we're talking 
Oh, everything, right? I mean, there, it seems that there isn't a campaign that isn't that isn't talking about recovering. And I'm I'm interested because we finally got the attentions of the Forbes and the and the Bloomberg's and and the Marses. You know, you, you, phenomenal listening to the new CEO of Mars here in Toronto saying that he wants a green economic recovery. Yeah, I think that's I, I raise my hands. Like, I'm done. I, this is amazing. That's fantastic. But I guess I'm interested in your perspective on how we optimize this moment to get at the systems change. Um, what, what should we be doing next? And I, and I think, you know, one of the things that I love about you is that you and I share an equal frustration with governments uh, in terms of the challenges of bringing about those systems changes. And you don't let that stop you. You say, fine, I'm going to go figure out how to do this in a market way. Um, and I'm going to find the partners and I'm going to build the allyship in the corporate or in the mainstream institutions and bring them on side. And so I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how we leverage this moment and what we should be doing next uh, to build this next economy, this vision of what we know we want. What, what, what should we be doing right now? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great, great question. And, and, I mean, not not easy one to answer in a short period of time, or it needs a long discussion. I, I was on a webinar yesterday, which I could only attend half of, um, so I'm sorry I missed um, it, but of Jed Emerson, who's one of my heroes in terms of, and he had this great, in the part that I uh, did catch, he, he had this great, he said it was a Buddhist saying, that said, uh, don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> and it, it was like, it was like, you know, you know, our tendency in this is just do something, you know, I mean, go, go, uh, you know, let's solve this. And that's the way the government has to act. And we, we've got all these crises and we, we've got to, and, and yet, boy, boy, we've got to think hard about what this looks like coming out. And we've got to, not just, you know, he was talking about in the scramble to make term sheets and the scramble to do these things. And, and we're using the vehicles that we've always used. And we don't want this to be like 2008, 2009, where, where we, we end up with, you know, what, what should have caused us to say, we got to do a fundamental rethink. We, we spent so much time getting everything organized out of the crisis and then everything went the same way. We've got to actually sort of be, you know, both patient and, sort of aggressive in this but but I think there's a there's a we've got to be careful about the tendency just to keep driving driving, driving, driving we'll solve this we'll solve this we'll solve this without the moment to reflect and say and and to involve the right stakeholders in that and and you know there was something in California that has um, something like 90 different uh, people that are going to join this I don't know if it was a task force or what it was, but it had everyone's voices. It had, you know, the voices of lived experience as well as the voices of venture capital, as well as saying, what do we have to make this look like? And, 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 and we need to be putting in place things like that. And, and, but I love Jed's, you know, don't do something, just sit there, you know? It's, I mean, it's a you know, wonderful kind of, you know, we've got to reflect, we've got to make sure we figure this stuff out. And I think we're getting the gong here, as I can Well, see. we are, but I'll just say, Bill, I, think, I, I, thank you for, I thank you for sitting here with us because, you know, I feel the same way. I feel like the rush, the rush, the rush, but, but Mother Earth told me to sit still, sent me to my room to think about things. Yeah. So I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. sitting here, I'm thinking, and I'm watching these campaigns, and part of my body is like, I must jump in. Another part of me is saying like, whoa, how can we be smarter uh, than ever? So um, I just have to say, you're amazing. You're no. just amazing. And I'm just going to, I just got to say it, like your innovative approach, your tenacity, your personal frustration, the, the, your commitment to working at those issues, it just, you never cease to entertain and engage and stimulate. And I've, I'm, uh, I'm inspired by you every time I have the opportunity to speak with you, Bill. And I know we've got lots of questions and people want us to talk about the community bonds and other good things, but I just really want to just say, Bill, I just, I honor and celebrate you, and I thank you so right much for your wisdom and your your uh, your your absolute awesomeness.
Mm-hmm. Well, likewise, Tanya, and likewise, CSI, and, and uh, I'm sorry we didn't get in on community bonds because I, I wanted to rant on banks. Um, oh, good. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Zoya's going to ask us the questions. So go ahead, Zoya. All right. So there are, there are about 10 questions that we have, but we'll try to get as many as we can in the next. Let's do the bonds minutes. first. <laughs> sure. Uh, there was a question about, um, let me just look for it right here. Uh, but yeah, so someone is looking for, for, for both of you to speak a bit more to community bonds, what they are, how they work, and the benefit of them. I can be really quick on this, but I'll also just say I'm not sure because I got cut off. Bill was our first in investor in the community bond, and it was so pivotal, so pivotal. This month is our 10-year anniversary uh, of creating the community bond, and Bill, along with 59 other uh, intrepid investors took a risk on this crazy idea and I'll never forget uh, saying Bill here's my big proposal my big business plan you know would you invest three hundred thousand dollars oh my god it was huge we're trying to raise two million and he goes he goes uh, Tanya uh, has uh, has Beth Coates read the financials I said oh yeah 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 <laughs> he goes I'll invest 150 and 150 became our benchmark amount and it was the amount that the other investors the larger foundation investors were able to match so the community bond is an investment in csi it's secured and backed against the value of our buildings and csi has used this tool now to raise over well a total of about six and a half million dollars of of um of capital invested from now over 300 community investors from with investments as small as a thousand dollars up to as large as now five hundred thousand dollars and they uh the the bond has just gone back on sale so the first 10-year uh bond uh came up for renewal right here in may and um we are selling uh the bonds and you can find out more about them on the on the website it's a three percent return for a three-year investment we've learned a tremendous amount um, about the bonds, but those that those early investors, the extraordinary leadership of Bill and, and many many others, has allowed CSI to now be the proud owner of about forty five million dollars of real estate assets in downtown Toronto. So, it's um, uh, you did it, you did it again, Bill. You want to add anything to that? Well, what what I wanted to add um, was. You know, we probably didn't get through all the questions we talked about, but you, you, I know you had said, what, what are the three things, Bill, you would do? And one, we got through two of them, uh, yeah. which was ESOP legislation and, you know, tax the foundations on. But I'd say the third one that I would, and I was using you and community bonds as an example of this, is I think it's time for a Community Reinvestment Act in Canada. Uh, <laughs> And for those who don't know anything about it, which, you know, I, I, it, it's, it's in, in the U.S., uh, the regulators saw that the banks were refusing to lend to economically deprived areas. They put a red line through it. And so this was called the red lining practice. And they said, you're not going to get your banking license unless you are actually lending money into those communities. And that sparked, banks didn't necessarily know how to do it. So they supported these community development financial institutions, community development venture capitalists, community development which means they're way more sophisticated in the U.S. around things like affordable housing, bonds, any of those things. And our banks in Canada, they, to their credit, they're very philanthropic. They have some incredibly talented people to think about, it, but none of this stuff is integrated into their mainstream business. And so something like community bonds, which would have a huge application in many places around Canada, Guess who the inventor is? It's Tanya Sermon. It isn't some financial, you know, why does the corporate finance part of banks not have a community bond area? They've got mining and, uh, you know, oil and gas experts and M&A people. Why don't they have affordable housing? Why don't they have, and they should, and if they don't, we need a community reinvestment. That would have been my rant because it's crazy that we don't have things like community bonds in a major way and that someone like CSI has to do it all themselves, um, y- you know, as if they are the community bond investment bank of, I mean, it's nuts. I mean, it's a great tribute that you did it, but, but it's symptomatic of what is missing in this country. That would have been my third. 
Love it. I love it. And Zoe, I know he's got another question, but I'll just say in make community bonds RSP eligible. That was something we had, which got retracted, which drives me mental. Zoya, ask your next question. Was okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So there is a question here. Um, Bill, can you please expand on the link between social finance, the work integration, social enterprise? social enterprise model and how you use it to get vulnerable people the skills they need for the changing nature of work or future of work. How can these ESOPs be sustainable with these multi-barriered individuals um, or would you rather uh, or, or rather could you share successful stories or examples? Yeah so I you know I probably didn't make clear that as we've move the, the the ESOP model for instance isn't insisting on the employment of people from you know who face employment barriers like we were in uh, phase one and phase two and arguably phase three uh, of our work um, so sorry for the confusion this this is we have broadened the scope of uh, you know the, the populations we are serving we're, we're looking at it at a broader you know, almost the 99% the and how do we think, you know, versus one and how do we think of a much more just uh, kind of system, uh, you know, so it's, whereas before it might be arguing that we were serving a very narrow focus on that, you know, 99%. So sorry for that confusion. The ESOP model doesn't explicitly do that. What I can say in terms of, you know, um, and I don't know that this answers the question, so my apologies if it doesn't, but but yes, we had, what, what we wanted to prove in phase one and phase two was that if you give people who face employment barriers an opportunity, they will perform. And, and because there's many people out there who are ready to have their lives turned around, they just need someone to give them the chance. And if there was one thing that came out of phases one and two, that was true in spades. Uh, both the social enterprises succeeded in any conventional way you can think of, but would have had very successful hiring and retention practices. And the proof was in the pudding in the private sector where 80 different business owners had the opportunity to dismantle the community hiring program without any penalty to themselves and every single one of them kept it. And they, you know, and, and as I say, Active Green and Ross uh, went and said, we wanna do this in our company owned stores. We don't need your financing, which was the, the insight for us to say, wow, you know, we've gotta get the system uh, to do this because the issue isn't that we can't get the people trained and, and performing. The issue is we're not doing it the right way and we need to change the system. And we didn't do so hot at that. Thanks, Bill. Uh, there was a, another question. You'd mentioned uh, the, the, the term or the phrase mezzanine debt, and someone was asking what that means for, 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 for non-finance folks. Yes, so sorry. Um, and uh, there's big danger getting into sort of some of these terms. So, you know, when you look at a, a way a business is financed, um, there are different sources of investors. Um, some can be lenders, so different sources of lenders and investors. The, um, if you go from a most risky to least risky, or, or least risky to most risky, the, you know, and the lowest return is, the lowest return is for banks and senior bank debt, and they take security over, you know, things like receivables and inventory, etc. The next risky would be mezzanine debt, where often you don't get any security in, in uh, your agreement and you're paid much more interest as a result of that. So senior debt would probably get an interest rate of say four or 5% now, mezzanine debt, depending on the business and you know, the, the amount of equity behind would might get sort of 10%, it isn't getting security. It's called mezzanine because it's between senior it's on the mezzanine level <laughs> and and equity which is the highest risk investment where people are saying well i might lose everything but i'm now a shareholder and if this company takes off i'll do way better than you know even the 10 percent on the mezzanine debt so so it's really a, a reference to the kinds of capital that a company you know seeks to finance themselves and the way that capital can be thought of as being provided 
and and really what we were saying was there was an opportunity for this particular form of capital in ESOPs, which hadn't been capitalized on. Beautiful. Thanks. And we have time for one more question, um, and it's about failure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so uh, as someone who came from the private sector, I wonder how, Bill, you see failure differently um, in the private sector versus the, the the social mission sector failure in the private sector can mean bankruptcy and wiping out shareholders but in the social mission sector failing can also mean causing harm to the very people we're working to support or aggravating the challenges uh, we're trying to solve how do we stay okay with failure while ensuring we mitigate the potential fallout as the stakes can be higher nice. yeah great question um and and no you know, easy formulaic answer to that question. Um, because there's, you know, it's a bit like, you know, the horrible trade-offs that government officials face right now in terms of whether to open up the economy and, you know, you open it up, you are going to cost lives. And what are, you know, how do you balance those things? How do you balance in, um, you know, the work we're doing in the nonprofit sector when, you know, in, in many ways, failure in what we've been working on isn't directly, mercifully costing lives or, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just failure means we're not improving them the way we thought we could or would. Uh, so the consequences aren't as great. But, but you don't want to always do what's safe either, you know, from a from either a business or a nonprofit. You know, I think one of the things that hurts the nonprofit sector, is because it doesn't have funding that encourages failure, it always ends up solving symptoms rather than root causes. And, and so, you know, it's important that obviously we provide meals to the homeless, but if we don't get at the root cause of what has caused homelessness and how we solve it, we're gonna be solving symptoms forever. And, and um, so when you get at root causes, you're liable to have much more failure. And, and, um, and failure in that case means you're not improving lives. So it's not as stark in terms of the meaning of it as, as it could be. But, but I still think we haven't encouraged more risk and, and, and with risk in anything we do, do means more failure. It means that in business, and frankly, it means that in anything we're trying to do from transformational from a social standpoint. And finding the right balance on that is such a tricky equation that neither I nor anyone I know really knows the answer to that would be my. Thank you, Bill. And thanks for sitting with us through that complexity. Um, and thanks to, to both you and Tanya for this uh, amazing conversation this morning. Um, there are tons more questions we have to wrap it up for today. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined us today for our first edition of Next Economy Conversations.